years ago, almost everyone in Wales lived in sight and sound of steam trains. They were part of the fabric of everyday life. Then in the early 1960s, Chairman of British Railways, Dr Richard Beeching, took an axe to the rail system of Wales. Within a few years, his plans for modernisation and efficiency closed hundreds of branch lines, stations and tunnels, and steam power was scrapped in favour of diesel. But Beeching had not reckoned on the passion for steam trains amongst the people of Wales. Put your head out the window and you get a face full of smoke. You come in, you're filthy, but it was great. <laughs> A small lad. When you were on that train, it was the power of the thing. You moved the regulator up, and within a few seconds, she'd respond. And suddenly, you know, you'd see the countryside starting to go faster. There was an art with the old steam. It was like a living machine, you know, and it was a sad to see the demise of it. It's nice to see the Prevision boys keeping it up, you know. In 1975, just eight years after the last steam engine ran on British Rail, a group of enthusiasts started Llangollen Railway. Other enthusiasts, like amateur cameraman Jim Clemens, kept the spirit of steam alive by filming branch lines before they closed. Much of this rare footage has never been seen on television before. By weaving it together with images from heritage railways and memories of the last heyday of steam in Wales, this is the story of a world almost lost forever to Dr. Beeching. One of the main reasons for people's fond memories of steam trains is because of the holiday excursions that took them to the Welsh seaside. In South Wales, many communities that lived in the valleys booked day excursions to Barry Island or Porthcawl, both reached directly by train from their local station. During the Biners' fortnight, Day excursions to Aberavon remained popular amongst Tronda families. Gareth Evans lived with his parents and younger brother in Triorchy in the 1950s. These trips now, they were either organised by local chapels or local working men's clubs. You'd never find the two amalgamating because the chapel people wouldn't get on very well with drinkers. But they'd be reserved entirely as an excursion train. So you'd get on at Triorchy station with your parents. And whoever's train it was, you'd have the chapel deacons or the club stewards marshalling you into some sort of order, shouting out, that's your coach, that's your coach, your parents have bundled you aboard, sandwiches have come out straight away, and it was a good day. Peter Roberts grew up near Blind Gwynvi in the Avon Valley. We'd pack up in the morning, sandwiches, bathers, bucket spades, and to see that train coming through, and the steam, and uh, the kids hanging out of the window, shouting and cheering. Get on a train, one compartment, basically to four or five families, it'd be crowded. Go down through Kama down through Dufferin and off into Aberavon. It was a brilliant day down there and in those days that was our holiday every day going down the beach in the miners uh, fortnight. In North Wales too steam railways were at the heart of the holiday experience. The Langotlan Railway likes to revive the appeal of the North Wales Radio Land Cruise that was part of a trend for steam train specials made popular in the 1950s. These cruises took holidaymakers on a tour around North Wales, sightseeing and stopping at resorts, all accompanied by commentary and refreshments. 
The routes varied, sometimes going via Codwen and Dolgetlai to the Cambrian coast and up to Hardlech before returning to Llandidno. These excursions ceased when the circular route was broken by the beaching cuts. Jenny Griffiths remembers tours to Hrill and Barmouth from her childhood home in Mould, Denbyshire. We used to go to Rell because my uncle lived in Rell. He was also on the railways and then we used to go and stay with him. We used to watch for Uncle Dyes in the signal box and quite often we used to go past the signal box and he'd be there looking through the window and he'd have a little wave and then uh, you'd pull into the station and get off the train. There were quite a few trains there because they'd have all sorts of trips and things going on. And when we were there, we used to go and we used to call a mystery tour. And you go to the station and uh, mum go and buy the tickets and you get on the train and you hadn't got a clue where you were going until you got there. Very often it used to be Barmouth, we used to go a lot. But it used to be fun. I think it was the noise of the train because if you sat there, you could hear the train going, got to go back, got to go back, got to go back, got to go back, all the way along. The love of steam is rooted in childhood memories. Many a Welsh schoolboy was drawn to train spotting, but it was not unknown for girls to take up the hobby as well. Jenny Griffiths lived half a mile from Mole Station. My friend and I, we used to go there a lot, train spotting as you do. So we had an exercise book each, and a pencil, and a rubber, and off we used to go, and we used to go on the station in Mould, and we'd sit and we'd watch all the goods and things what coming in, and watch the porters working, and the station master, and, and then we used to go over the bridge to the other side and watch the trains coming in the other way. And we used to sit in this wall for hours, fascinated by all these trains. It was the noise of it. It let off all the steam and then um, when he filled it up with the water, we used to find that quite fascinating because very often the fella that was filling it used to get wet as well. <laughs> so it was great fun actually. For many children, the best chance of getting a ride on a steam engine was at one of the coal field sidings near where they lived. Scenes like this have been common in North and South Wales in the 1940s when Harry Lowndes was growing up a few miles from the Carrach Colliery near Wrexham. This is the engine that I remember, the Welshman. The driver would be slowing down for you to get on the engine and, and have a ride up and come back down. You, it was great. You'd stand, one of you would be that end and one would be this end. Uh, and riding up and down and looking out, seeing where you're going. That was the engine, getting on the engine, riding the engine, that was great. Children who rode the footplates dreamt of one day being a train driver. For Mike Griffiths, who grew up in Mould, this dream came true while he was still a boy. At the age of 10, he befriended engine driver Bill Lewis, who taught him how to drive an engine. I got to know Mad Bill, as he was called, and he took me on the footplate and he taught me what the levers and all the rest of it for and how to drive a steam train. You get drawn to this massive metal beast. There was steam coming, there was a pressure valve going. It was just magnificent. The boy driver took trains as far as Bodvari, a few miles from Denby. Although engines of various sizes work the line, like this pannier tank commonly used in many parts of Wales, for a 10-year-old boy, all the controls on the footplate seem massive. The one Mike Griffiths liked best increased the speed of the engine. This was the regulator. I thought it was fantastic. 
because we had the regulator open and I was pushing up under the regulator. It was a huge thing. I wasn't that strong, but we managed to get it going. And the gauge said 40 mile an hour. And Bill said, that is as fast as it, you'll go. She won't go any faster. When you were on that train, it was the power of the thing. You moved the regulator up and within a few seconds, she'd respond. And suddenly, you know, you'd see the countryside starting to go faster. Despite the often friendly relations between crews and the public, the presence of children on a moving engine was strictly forbidden by British Railways regulations. And in 1956, the station master at Mould was determined to put a stop to the boyhood driving career of Mike Griffiths. There were several times I can remember quite clearly I was in a hell of a state because the station master came up the platform and he used to think, hello, how are you? And he used to talk like this. And he asked the engineer, had he seen me? No, he said, I haven't seen him today, Bill Lewis said, is he about? He said, he's about somewhere, he said, oh, he said, I haven't seen him. And I was on my knees, underneath the brakes, underneath the engineer's seat. I was in a hell of a state. He said, if he'd have stuck his head through the window, he'd have seen me. No, I haven't seen him at all, Bill Lewis said. And he said, uh, right, we're away. He said, we've got the signal. He took the brake off, pulled the regulator, and we all had a good laugh about it. At Llangollen Railway, volunteer crews work the footplates of the passenger trains. Drivers have qualified at the Heritage Railway after gaining experience and taking examinations. In the 1950s, passion for steam often did lead to a career on the railways. But a young fireman could expect to be kept in his place by the driver, very much boss on the footplate. In 1955, Brian King worked at Neath Yard when he first fired a passenger train to Brecon on what was commonly known as the N and B line. The first Brecon turn I had was uh, literally weeks after I got to Neath of Brecon. A uh, cleaner came over and he said, you've got to go on the 410 passenger to Brecon. So I'd never been through to Brecon at all by, by that time and uh, I was a bit uh, uncertain about the old thing, you know, but I had to do it, uh, no getting out of it. He was a fireman and he was expected to go, you know. So the driver was Ben Matthias, a typical grumpy type of driver, a kind of a white line through around the middle of the footplate and that was you were half and this was his and that was the type of man he was. It was quite a nice run actually. It was firing all the way to Oncloyne. You wouldn't see much of the scenery. He was firing all the way, you know. When he was shoveling, obviously up towards Oncloyne, when you got to Oncloyne, it's evened out a bit, you know. Um, yeah, you were down to your T-shirt. Um, we used to have a famous red scarf around the neck. Well, of course, that wasn't there for decoration. That was to wipe the sweat away. Um, and going through tunnels, you would have to put it over your mouth, you know, to stop the smoke and sulphur go going in. So there was that little red scarf we used to wear. Um, and then we used to tie knots in the four corners of it and put it on your head, you know, to keep your hair clean. Because uh, you didn't want to get your hair dirty when you were a youngster. In the Dee Valley, a train approaches the Berwyn Tunnel on the Llangollen Railway. The frequency of tunnels in Wales have often been a test of endurance for passengers and crew alike. Been brought up to it as a young fireman. I, I remember being a young fireman going through the first couple of times. It, it was quite frightening. 
you know, like uh, until you realised that it was uh, it was in the hands of an older hand driver then, like, and it was quite safe then, really. It was very, very smoky, very horrible, and very narrow. As you had to be careful, you wouldn't 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 look out to the engine or anything. It's because in some parts, it was, the, the the side of the tunnel was only about that much from the engine, like. It was reputed that the, the fumes in the tunnel were very good for bad chests. And I was and still am an asthmatic. So my parents had forced my head, physically forced my head, out of the carriage window. Now, one of these big leather straps, the window dropped down completely. Go on, get in, I don't breathe. Don't like it, breathe some more. The sound of the engine would magnify, it would be echoing all around you and clanging, banging, couplings back and forth, they were vibrating and you had a sense of being confined. Some people were almost terrified of the experience going through the tunnel, but we used to enjoy it. In the age of steam, hundreds of branch stations serve the industrial and rural communities throughout Wales. Here, a train bound for Brecon arrives at Talathlin Junction. Such scenes captured by amateur enthusiasts in the last days of this historic rail network are rare and remarkably valuable. Every line that snaked through every valley provided frequent access points for families and workers to travel to destinations near and far. The beaching cuts destroyed the way of life that had grown up around these stations, places of dependability held together by the people who ran them. The booking clerk provided a whole range of services available at each station. Glyn Jones remembers the process of issuing tickets at Prestatin. Draw tickets out of the rack, cardboard tickets out the rack. Had it in between your thumb and finger. And <coughs> but twice, that meant both ends had been beated. So it was, <coughs> it was a flick of the thumb and finger. <coughs> Turn it round, you see. Press that in. We had a row of tickets racks there and another row down there. Some were in geographical order and some were in alphabetical order, you see. And the pressures were on. But, uh, of course, you float, the money you float. Pound notes, ten shilling notes, crowns, florins, shillings, sixpences, pennies and halfpennies, all in rows, you know. <laughs> At many stations, like here at Llanarthne on the line to Carmarthen, signal men did the job of crossing keeper, booking clerk and porter, all rolled into one. Points and signalling levers were sighted outside on the platform to make it possible to carry out all these jobs single-handed. On the line from Chester to Denby, closed in 1962, relief signalman Harry Lowndes worked at most of the stations in the late 1950s, including Llong in Flintshire. We used to cover signal boxes and platform staff. So we used to issue tickets at all different stations. At Clong, it was a station um, in the office, used to be selling tickets to the passengers for the passengers to go on the trains, and he was also a signalman where he'd had levers, on the, and they were on the platform. The station house at Long has survived to the present day. After being abandoned for many years, it is now being slowly restored as a private dwelling. Harry Lowndes is visiting Klong Station with Jenny Griffiths, whose grandfather, George Parry, worked as a signalman there from the 1920s. Harry kept a piece of wood from the station after it closed. Oh, what's... This piece of wood, if you look on it, and you'll see... <gasps> My grandfather's name on it? Yeah? And the year? 
1929. January 29. And all the names and I mean, yeah, if you and look... Long Station 1854. Yep. As with all signal men who worked the line, Jenny Griffiths' grandfather, George Parry, had many responsibilities, but he always had time for family visits. When I was little, I used to get the train here with my mum and my sister, but my sister was three years younger than me, so she'd only be a tot. And we used to come here and get off the train. And then if my grandfather was working, we used to stay and watch what he was doing. And he used to um, close the gates. The gates used to go over the road and he used to close those down and uh, then he'd come up and he'd be pulling the levers on here, you know, and we used to think it was fantastic, we used to think it was big, big muscles, you know, to pull those levers. And uh, that's when he used to help people on and off the trains. But the one thing I do remember was to get on the train, we used to have to go up the steps. The steps, the yeah. steps. Two, yes. yes, was it two? Well, if anybody was getting on the train or off the train, you had to carry him from there to, where, to which carriage the people were getting in or out of, and put the steps there and put your foot on them, see if they're moving so the people could get, come, climb down or climb up into the carriage. And then you'd move the steps away. The station house at Long had been built in 1849 as part of the Saltney to Mould branch line. Victorian railway companies tended to favour a similar design of house for each station. Down the line from Long was Hope and Penafarth, in 1959, Glyn Jones applied for the station master's vacancy here. Such was the standing of the job in the age of steam, the local newspaper reported Glyn's success. And with the job came the station master's house. But when Glyn arrived from Prestatin with his young family, he found his idea of the rural idyll was not matched by British Rail. The house wasn't bad, really. Uh... It was a nice open view from one side and there was a shop on the other side. But we'd got two little children then and there was no toilet. And we've got two little children. So we write and ask, see if we can have the uh, toilet put in. And we got a very, uh, to my mind, a rude reply from the head office. That um, you must remember that Penafor is a place in rural Wales and no, not every rural place in Wales has an indoor toilet, so why should you have one, you know? Oh dear. But eventually, we did get one put in. I enjoyed the work, and I enjoyed the staff and the company. I was lucky, I had good staff. It didn't treat me as the boss like you're one of us, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Harry Jones, who also looked after the station gardens in Benefar, which incidentally got first prize twice for station gardens. <laughs> he had a terrific whole length of the one platform was different coloured geraniums all the way along. It was marvellous. And of course the white platform edges, which Fred Foster used to do. He was keener on the brush and shovel and cleaning, the, keeping the place tidy, yeah. Glyn Jones and his family had to move out of their station house at Hope in Penafort when the Denby line closed to passenger traffic in April 1962. But one member of staff was able to continue. Relief signalman Harry Lowndes frequently worked at the signal box during the five years the line stayed open to carry goods trains. Unlike most station houses along the line, Glyn Jones's old family home still stands amongst a modern housing estate. Harry Lowndes got to know the new owner, Ray Ankers, while working at the signal box, but has not been back for many years. Oh, my God, Harry, how are you doing, lad? All right, Ray. How are you, sir? Hey, you're looking well. I don't know if they hey. too bad, are they? Well, still here, and that's the main thing, lad, isn't all right, it? Hey. All right. Former fireman Ray Ankers has spent nearly 50 years adapting his station master's house into a unique home. You wouldn't recognise the old place now? Well, no, not all this. You put all this on. Aye, me and, a, me and my mate across the road on there. Ah. It wasn't all that much different, really. Like, the only thing we had, we had to have new windows and 
and we had it right it rendered didn't it because I've got a photograph there on there it's the house exactly as it was with the brick. it's in the conservatory with there the brick. with the brick it was all it's just a brick like here oh you've still got open Ben Ford on the plat off the platform well I look after the signs I ah. well trying to make it look original as possible like you know I think you've got the signal in there in the right place or the in wrong, the wrong place? place. I know. The wrong place. I had, I had an awful job when I put it up there, man. Because yeah, it's distant. No, it, it's, a, it's a western signal, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. There's the school there and the boxes. Well. Near yeah. about where that lamp is there, more or less, is. Yeah, the school was about 20 yards away from the signal box. That's it, yeah. Here in the Avan Valley, signs of the old railway lines and stations are difficult to find. Before the beaching cuts, the trains that travelled to and from Abergwynfi and Blaengwynfi were vital to local communities. The valley has changed greatly since Peter Roberts was a boy. We're in Blaengwynfi, uh, just just across the, the dividing line from Abergwynby and uh, the river just there, that's the dividing line. The Abergwynby station. The station was just to the left of the, the river, just in amongst the trees there. Uh, actually, there's nothing left of the, the station now, but uh, that was the terminus for uh, the Meisteg to Bridgend and Cardiff line. Life in the Avan Valley is much quieter than in the age of steam. The stations have long gone and the tracks have been replaced with footpaths or left to nature. Much of the landscaping created as the lines crisscross the river can still be found, if sometimes a little hidden. But like many valleys that once reverberated to the sounds of steam power, the Avan holds mixed emotions for people who remember the railways. It ruined this valley when they closed the lines. The tourism that this valley could have now with this line and with Avan Argoid and uh, all the cycle tracks here, it would be unbelievable. Richard Burton called this valley Little Switzerland in Wales, and I'm sure well, they come from all over the world now just to go on the cycle tracks here. Every year, thousands of visitors beat beaching at Llangollen Railway. It is as if time stood still as they relive the joys of steam railways in the setting of the picturesque Dee Valley. Today, there is a new commitment to restore some of Wales' historic branch railway lines. Steam is now regarded as an important part of the Welsh tourist industry to be preserved and cherished. On Heritage Railways, steam-hauled passenger trains continue to attract many visitors to the joys of a bygone age. They are a reminder of how much steam power lay at the heart of Welsh communities. And the series concludes at the same time tomorrow night on BBC Two Wales, half past seven. Next tonight, a metal detector discovery of Saxon gold. The story of the Staffordshire Horde.